morning. We have an update from Papua New Guinea. Uh, it's been just over three years now since I was visiting the Burtons and the Russells in Papua New Guinea, and a lot of things have been uh, transitioning and changing uh, in the Western Province, as, uh, as you'll hear in this update. Brother Burton starts by quoting uh, Philippians 1.3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. The call for Paul and company to come and help those in Macedonia always rings true in the heart of a missionary and those with a heart for missions. We had a couple who have such a heart come and stay with us during the month of August and September. Jim and Mary Doyle from New Man Baptist Church came and helped us in Lutheran, and what a blessing they have been to us. They came in wanting to help in whatever way we needed them, so they have been cleaning, cooking, preparing with Polaris, sanding church floors, and helping our, in our teacher's training conference. They have been, shown themselves to be such willing servants and have been so blessed to have, we have been blessed to have them here. As we have said before, we love having people come visit us in PNG, and so if you're thinking about taking a missions trip, we would love to have you come check out our people and the wonderful country of Papua New Guinea. Acts 16, 9, come over to Macedonia and help us. A little over a year ago, a national man stood with me in Port Moresby and said, can you pray for Bougainville? Bougainville is an island that's separate from the main island of PNG. That same week, four different people, all unrelated to each other, would make a statement in passing to me that would go something like this. There are no Baptist missionaries on the island of Bougainville. These circumstances caused me not only to pray, but to ask Amy to pray with me about the island of Bougainville, and that maybe we could find a missionary interested in going to this island. I later spoke to our pastor, Pastor Laversi, of the unique comments that kept people kept telling us of this island and how we were praying for people to go, and his reply was, maybe you should visit Bougainville. With some prayer and counsel, we followed his advice, and in January, for our 25th wedding anniversary, Amy and I traveled to Buka, the capital of Bougainville. We then drove to Arawa, the former capital, and stayed for five days. While we were there, we attended a small fellowship where we heard the leader state, you are the first missionaries we have seen in 28 years. It was as if that Macedonian man in Acts 16 now stood in front of me saying, can you come help us? During that week, many others came and asked if we would come and teach them. And some would say, we have prayed for many years that God would send us a missionary. Amy and I arrived back in Port Moresby with a burden for this people and could not stop telling other missionaries and fellow Christians of this great need. In April 2016, some PNG national men informed me that they intended to travel to Arawa. The men asked if I would travel with them, and through an unexpected blessing, God provided the necessary funds for this additional expense. A week after this trip, Amy and I both started praying fervently and seeking God's will and his direction for our ministry. Amy and I believe that God has called us to go to Bougainville, Papua New Guinea. Weeping Baptist Church is ready to take on its first national pastor, Arusa. We've seen pictures of him. We've mentioned him many times. And we have seen our people grow tremendously since we have told them we would be leaving. They have started to teach and train their own and have been striving to start taking more off of Amy and I since we, and become more self-sufficient and sustaining. So the Burtons are looking for uh, moving from about as far west as you can get in Papua New Guinea to going about as far east as you can in New Guinea. So let's remember to pray for Arusa and Sasai. They are the leaders in uh, Weeping Baptist Church for uh, Brother Russell and for the Burtons. He's going to be traveling back to Weeping to ordain some men to be going out from Weeping into other villages. And I imagine that this is particularly maybe even troubling for Brother Russell as he has uh, moved on from a couple of churches that and left them in the hands of national men, one of them who decided to leave the ministry. So this is probably a particular burden for Brother Russell, knowing that uh, the temptations for national men to leave the ministry once they have taken a church, because it's happened to him once before. So pray in particular for the Russells, the Burtons, for Arusa, Sasai, and the villages around Weeping and in Daru, and for the people of Bougainville. Let's pray for the offering. Dear Lord, we do thank you for these updates from halfway around the world. We thank you for uh, missionary couples and families that are willing uh, to leave the states, to live in the jungle, and to minister to people. Lord, we pray for these people that um, haven't had uh, a missionary in 28 years. Lord, that, that may be an indication that they need some new training, uh, that national men need to rise up on that island of Bougainville to lead their people. Lord, we thank you for 
um, the opportunities that you've given us to pray for them. Lord, we thank you for uh, the opportunity you've given us to support them financially as well. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember that when we give our tithes and offerings, that people around the world are hearing the gospel and being ministered to uh, through the gifts that we give back to you, a portion of what you've allowed us to earn. We thank you for that, Lord. Please bless this offering today in Jesus' name. Amen. Melody, O oh, thou that changest not, abide with me. One phrase that a song, by the way, if you need a King James Bible to, to use, please lift your hand. If you don't have a King James Bible in your possession, uh, then please take this as our gift to you. And uh, if you do, but just didn't bring it, leave this one behind. We'll, we'll keep it going until it finds a home with someone who does not yet own a King James Bible. But uh, one of the phrases out of that song, which is uh, so sweet, are the words, point me to the skies. Point me to the skies. And indeed, our, our affection is to be on things above, not on things of this earth. And we're looking forward to hearing from our Lord that trumpet call in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with our Lord. All right, I'll give you a scripture in just a moment. Just have your Bible ready, if you will, please. Adam and Eve were created with a given a perfect home where God meant for them to live forever. What God does for us, he intends to last throughout eternity. Likewise, all he has asked us to do for him, he desires us to perform consistently and proficiently for the rest of our lives. It's not just for a little span of time after we're saved and we're excited, it's to go on till it becomes routine, at times perhaps even drudgery. But still, we just continue on. It's, it's like so many other things in life. You don't always love going to your job. You don't always appreciate getting up in the middle of the night taking care of a sick child. You don't always like having to, you know, I, I, there's times I just, I just like, man, I wish I could just bypass the whole routine in the morning. That, that, that time spent shaving and brushing teeth and doing all the things, you know, just get rid of the day. It's like, oh, just so mundane. And I can understand why, you know, guys sometimes just get a little slovenly and start neglecting themselves because it's just it's something it's not enjoyable but just has to be done you just simply do it and uh, so but but it's same with the spiritual things they're not always exciting not always fun not always do they thrill your heart and fill you fill you with that warm presence of the lord that sense of his presence but you do it anyway and then from time to time you do get uh, all those those wonderful feelings that accompany what you're doing which makes it that much that much better but whether we have the feelings or don't have the feelings, we're to serve him as he has asked us to do and do it consistently all of our lives. God made great promises to Abraham because the Lord had great expectations from Abraham. He wanted Abraham and his offspring to keep the Lord's covenant throughout their own lives and then to so train their children that for the generations to follow, they're, 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 all those offspring of Abraham would continue to do what God had told Abraham to do. So as to go from Abraham to his children, to his children's children, and continue on throughout 
the generations that would follow. The secret of Abraham's success was that Jehovah could say about him, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the ways of the Lord to do justice and judgment. God made elaborate promises to Israel. He then declared to them as his people, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. How much that parallels what God expects of us as Christians, we too are to be a peculiar people. Something special, something set apart, something uniquely His. I, easily identifiable by the fact that we're just simply different from the world around us. And he, indeed, for us, as He had intended for Israel, He wants us to be a kingdom of priests. In fact, we're to reign and rule with Him in the kingdom age as kings and priests of our God. We're to be to Him a holy nation. A covenant is a two-way street. God blesses you to the, to the degree that you obey him. For I the, Lord, for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. That's the evidence of the love we have for God, is keeping his commandments. A curious balance exists between God and his people. God has glorious intentions for you, but they come with certain obligations that he places upon you. Because he is your God, you are obligated to obey him. He declared, ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. It is to your advantage to honor the Lord by keeping his commandments. You live in them when you learn what pleases your Lord and what he expects of you, and you do those things steadfastly for the rest of your life. That's how you demonstrate your love for Christ. There is a definite connection between your love of God and your obedience to God. That obedience is to start the day that you get saved and continue for the rest of your life. I'm going to have you now please to have you please turn to John 14, verse 15 in your Bible. John 14, 15. I'm going to quote to you a couple of the scriptures, but then we're going to pray, after which we'll look together at John 14, 15, which you will have ready. There are added blessings and benefits that come from your obedience to the Lord. David explained to the people of his time, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. King Solomon echoed that sentiment when he wrote, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You have a duty to fear God and keep his commandments. It is often difficult and costly to do your duty, but the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul demands that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what? Your reasonable service. Spiritual leaders are to set an example of submission to the Lord that their people can follow. God's people distinguish themselves from their unsaved counterparts by heeding the word of God. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord Jesus, having laid now this foundation, would you please build upon it through your Holy Spirit and impress upon our hearts how this, these things are not options. You did not die to give us a smorgasbord of choices. Those things that please us will do for as long as they continue to, to thrill us. And when they no longer uh, tintillate us and no longer motivate us, then somehow... The obligation ceases, and we no longer have to do those things we don't care to do. God, I don't know where this strange fallacy came from. I'm sure it's, it originates with Satan. But nonetheless, Lord, I pray that you'll help us as people who claim to love you, claim to be Bible-believing Christians. That you'll help us, Lord, to, to realize that there are things you've written in your book 
that have not changed simply because we went from Old Testament era to New Testament era. We know many things have changed, but others have not. And even in the New Testament, you have demands of us. They are not optional. They are obligatory upon every Christian. Every teenager here, every single adult, every married adult, every senior saint, we all have obligations to you, and I pray that we'll recognize that and honor that and thereby show our love tangibly to you. For this we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. That requirement of submissiveness to the Lord was not limited to Israel, nor did it end with the close of the Old Testament. Even in this age of grace, the Lord expects absolute obedience from his disciples. Christ declared in, you have, you're holding it there, John 14, verse 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. This is not just something you can just bypass, well, that's Jehovah, Old Testament. You know, no, this is Jesus, New Testament. If you love me, keep my commandments. And then verse 23. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will do what? He'll keep my words. So well, what does God expect of us? It's in the book. We have an instruction manual. It's all right here. It's not a matter of, I got a vision, and God wants us to do thus and so. Well, that's, that's all well and good, but I, I'm not interested in your vision. I'm interested in the book. You know, Peter was allowed to see and hear. He was allowed to hear the very voice of God the Father. And, he said, he, and Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy, and it doesn't come through dreams, it doesn't come through visions, it doesn't come through miraculous powers. Satan can do all that. But it's pre what's preserved for us here in the book, what the Bible tells us, we believe specifically the King James Bible is the source of all truth for us in these latter days. If you, in verse 23 again, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and will come unto him, and make her abode with him. I, I wish you were just half as good a Christian to Jesus as my wife is a wife to me. What I mean by that is when she listens to me and she hears what my preferences are, so often she will change what she would like to conform to what I would like. And I don't, I'm not standing there with a club, you know, demanding that she do these things. And I don't, I don't punish her if, 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 in fact, sometimes I insist, let's do, let's do what you want for a change. It doesn't always have to be about me. But just recently, Miss Tricia, our, our eldest daughter that lives with us, she commented, as she has been said so many times in our household, yeah, Dad, this is another thing Mom made for us for dinner that she doesn't like, but she knows we do. So she made it for us. And you know what? That is love. She, 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 she finds out what pleases her husband, and then she, she does those things. And that's how we're to show our love for Jesus. If any man love me, he will keep my words. We're, we're studying what he has to say, and we conform ourselves to this. And that's not just limited to the, old, the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. Hey, just because we have a New Testament doesn't mean everything from Genesis to Malachi no longer has any application to us. As a matter of fact, uh, the Old Testament provides us illustrations of New Testament truth and vice versa. Now, I understand there are many things in the Old Testament that are no longer placed upon us. I'm grateful we're not, we don't have an altar up here. We're going to do bloody sacrifice. I'm, I'm glad for that. I, I, get, I get queasy about that stuff. That's why I'm, I'm pers I, I rejoice with you guys who get your buck every season. And, uh, but, you know, I'm just not into the blood sports personally. I talked to Pastor John Evertson in Woodland yesterday, and he and his boys just been out shooting, getting ready, because he said for us, next week begins deer season, and they're after it. Man, I rejoiced when Brother, brother uh, uh, Byron Hall, who's right now serving in uh, Children's Church, praise God for a man who, who loves kids that much, to, to, to go and just help, help take care of kids. But, but uh, you know, I rejoiced when I saw that he got his buck this year, and a hand, handsome animal it is. Uh, but it's, it's not me, and I'm just not, I'm not into the, you know, the, the hunting, and, and I praise God for those of you that can raise animals and slaughter them, and 
then I'm glad I know what address to go to if we ever have a real emergency in this country and run out of food. I know right which homes to go to, uh, who will look out for me and feed me and take care of me. And, and so I, I'm grateful for that uh, insider information. But, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's just, and, and, if I, and if I had to, I would do it. I, you know, if it came down to take, take, take care of my family or get rid of Max or whatever it takes, you know, but anyway, anyway uh, I, I would indulge. I would indulge, <laughs> oh, make sure that doesn't get to certain quarters, uh, this, this, this recording. But, uh, but we, don't, we're not, we don't do that. There's other things that were not, not placed upon us, and I, re, I praise God for that. But nonetheless, I would say the vast majority of what we're given as far as principles in the Old Testament are still there for us today. And they, show, they give us glimpses into the mind of God how he thinks and and what he likes and what he doesn't like and it, and i found that it's not a hard thing it's not a big deal to conform my tastes to that which is pleasing to the lord there's certain things i do that i i i would not do in the natural man but but we i do it as unto the lord it lord this is for you and i'm willing to do this for you i wouldn't do it for anybody else but i'll do it for you there is a special relationship notice it's not a part of verse 23 says, if, 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 well, there's that part, if, you, if a man love me, he will keep my words. But then it goes on to say, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. There is a special relationship with the Savior that is reserved to the saints who will yield themselves to him as their Lord. There's no getting around that. I, I have four children. I love my four children equally. But we do not have equal relationships. You know, the relationships vary among my four children based on uh, the degree to which they want to be close to their father, to the degree that they want to honor their father, and, uh, and, 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 and it draws them in, in closer, or it creates a barrier, which, by the way, I do not erect. But it's, it's there, and there's a distance that's there. And that's, that's not my choice, but it's a reality. And so it is between me and my Lord. There are times in my life I feel so close to Christ. There are times I feel such a distance. And as the old saying goes, if you feel like you've gotten away from the Lord, guess who moved? He's, he's right there the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't, he hasn't moved. There's no shadow of turning with him. It, you're the one who'd made up choices that have, that have distanced you, you, yourself from him. That lordship that we're, to, that we're to acknowledge is made real and practical by doing all those things which he has commanded of us. Joel, look just a little further, please, to John 15, verse 10. Next chapter, John 15 and verse 10. That special relationship that you can have with Christ is emphasized again in John 15, verse 10, which says, If ye, next three words, keep my commandments. Now, I appreciate that word, if. The Lord says, I, you're a human being. You're a free agent. I did not compel you to get saved, and I do not compel you to uh, acknowledge my lordship. I do not compel you to obey me. You, you know, no one's going to, you, you miss a week of church. No one's going to show up at your door, drag you out of your house, and stone you to death. You know, and in fact, we're not even going to, uh, unless, we're even going to, we, we try to give you the dignity that, you know, we, we assume if you're not here for a given service, you must have been sick or something must have come up because surely you would have been here. And, and we don't, you know, we don't, not, they're banging your door and, you know, and, and there comes a point at which we've not seen you for a little while. We may want to find out what's going on because we're concerned. There's, a, there's that balance. You don't want to be intrusive, but you also don't want to be just ignoring a person either. But, but I'm just saying that we're, we're, not, we're not here to compel you to do anything if you keep my commandments. That's a choice you have to make. But if you will, the next part of verse 10 says, ye shall, and what's the next four words? Abide in my love. So the love is there. The love in that sense is static. It, it, it's, it's, it's there. It's like the Pacific Ocean. It's just there. And if, if you uh, want to 
get in your car or even take take a, a bus and go to the coast for a, a day it's it's there it's there for you to enjoy and if you rather not you can you can live the next 20 years in santa rosa and 45 minutes away from the ocean and never see it and that's 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 your choice that's up to you it, it, same with the love of christ it's there and if you want access to it if you want to feel it if you if you want to if you want to swim in it you want to be immersed in it you want to be surrounded by it you want to revel in it, it it's available it's all based on if if you keep my commandments and the lord says hey there's i, I can give you a, uh, an example an illustration if you keep my commandments you shall abide in my love even as i have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love now that's fascinating because god the son while he was in human flesh, chose to keep his father's commandments. By the way, he was beholden to everything that he had given us in his Old Testament. He, the author, had come down and become human flesh, and he, he obeyed all of his own commandments and thereby honored God the Father. So he set the example. By the way, that's... That's, a, that's a, an atom bomb to all of our excuses. But I just can't. Oh, yes, you can. Jesus did, and he was man as much as you are. And, and you can, as he did, keep his commandments and honor your father and abide in his love. Now, can I say to you, this is not conditional love in the sense that uh, you know, he, he, Lord loves those that obey him, and he doesn't love those, or he hates those that don't obey him. It's a matter of conditional proximity to that love. It's, it's, it's how close you choose to be to that love. See, that's, that's the thing. It, it's, the love is not conditional. On, he, you know, the Lord already proved that he loves you, but God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, how did the Lord prove it? Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That love was there even before you got saved. How much more so now that you are adopted into his family as a full-fledged son of God. He loves you. That's not the issue. It's your proximity to the source of that love. Your obedience determines how close you're allowed to approach that source of all love, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. As you submit yourself to the Holy Spirit, he draws you near to your Savior. When you defy him by violating the plain commands of Scripture, you drift ever further away from Christ. And that's why at times you're filled with doubts. I'm not even sure anymore if Christ even exists. You know, I don't hear that too much from dedicated Sunday school teachers. I, I've, I've, not had that, I've not had that issue too much from, from, from faithful soul winners. I mean, people are going out on purpose to share their faith with others. I, I, just, I just don't sense that. Uh, and, and believe me, and I realize we're all subject. We're all, we all have that, that extra voice in our brain, which is the devil. So we're dealing with the flesh. We're dealing with the devil. The, the, the world is screaming at us, you know, it's, it's uh, atheism. And so I'm, I'm sure any, any Christian is susceptible to some, some degree of doubt. But it certainly has magnified the more I get away from the Lord and I start, and I start succumbing to it. The doubts become overwhelming. So that degree of your submission to the Lord is determined by, by you. The extent of your fellowship you'll have with him is determined by, by you. If you'll keep his commandments, you will abide in his love. The contrary then is, if you refuse to keep his commandments, uh, the love is there, but you're distancing yourself from it. And that's why you're starting to not sense the love like you maybe once did early in your Christian life. You're in the Gospel of John, toward the back of your Bible is the little book of 1 John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, just prior to the Revelation. Would you please go back to 1st John chapter 2? The book of 1st John chapter 2. Let me speak to you that are actively serving the Lord. 
We have far more people involved in the ministry than just the pastor. And I praise God for that. In fact, ideally, we're all to be his ministers. We, we just talked about that extensively on Wednesday night. It's, it's a good Bible study. You may want to want to check out. It's uh, archived online. But, uh, uh, but we're all to be ministers of his. Whatever the Lord has given you to do in ministry, you need to faithfully maintain it until the Lord calls you to another field of service. So I, I recognize sometimes God does call people away. It, it's heart-wrenching. But I, I've, I've never tried to talk someone out of a move when they say, I, Pastor, I think God wants us to go to such and such place. Well, do you have a church there? Do you have a pastor there? Have you checked it out? Have you, have, you, have you tried the spirits, whether they are of God? Are you sure? Oh, yes, Pastor, we have a pastor there. We have a church. We, 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 we really believe this is what God wants for us. It's like, man, I'm going to miss you. You've been such a blessing. But, yeah, I release you to that definitely want you to stay in the will of God. So the Lord, you, you, you faithfully maintain your ministry until he calls you to another field of service or another type of service. There may come a point at which the Lord may, may change the, the age group you work with or, or may uh, take you from one type of ministry into another type of ministry as your primary form of service to him. And we acknowledge that. Sometimes the Lord does change things up. And there comes a day in which he will call you out of his service. And I don't think you should look for that retirement, especially because that's called death. All right? When you stop serving God, when you die. Say, well, you know, like I'm 97 years old and I can't hardly do anything anymore. You know, I, I, I got so few teeth, I can barely even chew the, on the, the food, the, the bread of the word of God anymore. I just, I'm just, I'm just, man, I'm just like on death's door. Do you still have a mind? Do you still have communication with God? Can you pray? Man, just, just you, you can do so much for me and for this church just by being a prayer warrior until you finally just lose your mind and, and the Lord ultimately calls you home. We understand there comes, there comes that, that point for, for every human being, but, but that's when you're out of his service. When you're dead, it's over. So right now, if you're breathing God's air and you're sitting in this seat in this church, you do have a ministry. I don't know if you're in the ministry God to which God's called you. I don't know if you're doing what God is, a, is asking you to do, but you do have a place to serve, even if it's just in prayer, but you do have a place to serve. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the younger preacher Timothy, that good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. So you've been, you've, you've been committed by him to do something, Hey, you keep it up. You keep it up. As Paul wrote elsewhere, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. In other words, you have certain gifts that the Lord's not going to recall. Now, they, they may be lying dormant because you haven't been utilizing them, but you do have gifts and you have a calling. You have a place of service. I don't know if you picked up the phone and answered the call, but it's been ringing. And I think the Lord's getting a little tired of having everything go to voicemail to only get ignored and deleted. So you have, there's, there's a calling of God, and it's, not, it's without repentance. God does not change his mind about the gifts he's given you or the calling he has given you. And I, the, the only question is, you're in a race of time. There's going to come a day at which you probably will be physically unable to keep up with little children <laughs> and manage little kids. So if your calling is in that ministry... You better get on it while you can. I, I, may, it may be teenagers. And there comes a point at which, you know, I, I, I suppose unless we get an elevator, there will come a day at which we can no longer get David Scott in his wheelchair up to the teen ministry. We'll have, we'll, have to, we'll have to look at alternatives at that point, have them meet with them in the parking lot or something. But, but you know, there, there, there comes a point at which for, for, for everybody, there, there's a, I understand, but you know, I think even the person who can no longer work, work with little kids has a heart for them and still finds a way to be a blessing to them. And the man who no longer can work with the teenagers still has a heart for teenagers, praying for the teenagers, and, and trying to encourage them even to the end of his days. Obedience is the essence of discipleship. It is the basis of a deeper, richer fellowship with your master. 
Here in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3, we're told, and hereby we do know that we know him if, oh my, there's that troubling little word again, if we do what? Keep his commandments. So how do I know that I know him? By doing what? Keep his commandments. That means if I don't keep his commandments, I'm going to get to a point where I don't know if I know him. You know, there's a parallel scripture to this. I believe it's, oh man, what is it now? I think it's Second Peter chapter 1. But anyway, it uh, has to do with add to your faith, virtue. And, to, and then you add to virtue and you add to this and you, add, you keep adding, 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 growing, 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 becoming more and more perfect in the, in the mature, sense of maturity in the Lord. And, uh, and then the, the, the scripture goes on to say, the person that neglects that process can come to the point where he forgets he was purged from his old sins. He even forgets he's even saved. The ultimate doubt. I'm not even sure I'm even, sure I'm even saved, man. I don't know if I'm going to heaven or hell. Well, man, 10 years ago you were pretty firm on that. What happened? Well, let's see. Let's go back and look at your life these last 10 years. Man, 10 years ago you were on fire for God. You had no doubts about your salvation. Over time, you became more enamored with making money, having things, living a good life. You became less and less interested in spiritual things. And now all of a sudden, look at you. You got all this stuff and no peace in your heart. And you're full of doubts and fears. Verse 4 says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a what? He's a liar, and the truth is not in him. Oh, my. You think I get hard sometimes? Nothing like what the Holy Spirit does, speaking through the, the authors of Scripture. He says, yeah, you claim you're a, you're a Christian. You claim that uh, you know the Lord, but you're not keeping his commandments. You, sir, are a liar. Let's just be honest. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Unless you're a certain presidential candidate and liar, liar, pantsuit on fire. But you are, you are a liar. Claim you know him and you don't keep his commandments. And, and you know what you've been trained. You know what God expects of you. But you've just decided you're too important or too busy or too whatever to have to pay attention to these little details. And now you still want to claim, oh, how I love Jesus, liar. Oh, how I love, liar. Liar! Maybe that's why you struggle sometimes to sing his praises. You got this conscience thing saying, do you really want to be that hypocrite? And by the way, this is a church, we love hypocrites. Bless God, we have Pastor Arthur Hypocrite Miracle right up here preaching to you right now. We, we, we are, we're a church filled with hypocrites. Those people that, that, that uh, you know, they, they say, man, I... I, I just don't like going to, to a church that's full of hypocrites. Well, come on, we have room for one more. You're welcome here. We love hypocrites in the sense that we understand none of us are where we really ought to be, doing everything we know we should do. But bless God, that's one thing to realize that and, and, and you fight against it to their, your last breath. And another thing just to give into it and say, oh, well, I'll never be a good Christian, so I'm not even going to try anymore like the foolish, foolish, foolish young woman I talked to who said, well, I've already messed up. I already slept with a guy, so I might as well just go all the way with everybody. Stupid. Man, you realize you made a mistake? You sinned against God? You stop right there and fix it. Don't just wallow in it like a pig. Now, this person who is a liar, he might be saved. I hope he is but he doesn't truly know the Lord. Can I say that to know him is to what? To love him. And you, how do you love him? Keep his commandments. But he's now drifted so far from the Lord, he only thinks he knows him, but he doesn't really. You know, it, <laughs> if I was so foolish as to leave nirvana, I mean paradise, I mean heaven on earth, I mean life with Laura, I say it because we have an old, old movie called Life with the Father. So, you know, this is Life with Laura. If I was ever so foolish as to, as to leave that, and then and, and years go by, and they'd say, 
miracle, miracle. Do you know a Laura miracle? Well, sure I do. No, I don't. That was, ten, that was her 10 years ago. I have no idea what, what she is a decade later. And you know Jesus? Oh, yeah, I know Jesus. How do you know Jesus? I walked with him 10 years ago. You know, there's, there's, I'm not saying he changes, but I'm, I'm saying that your perception of him does. And you don't know him like you think you know him when you're not walking with him. Verse number five, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Praise God, there's just so much more love to have access to and different kinds of love. Man, it's, it's, like, it's like, you know, uh, I, I, I love pizza. What teenagers here can say amen? But it's a different love than I have for, for I want to say puppies, but then I, I conjure up visions of, of, of this, a certain dog that competes in my household for all the love and attention, just sucks all the attention right out of the room with every female that walks in the door. So, I, so but anyway, I, I have a different love for, for puppies. It's a living, breathing thing. But you know, that's a different love than I have for my, my fellow church members. And that's a different love than I have for my children. And that's a different love than I have for my wife. And ideally, that is a different love than I have for my Savior. There, there's love and then there's love. And there's a love I can have even with my wife that is at one level and over time matures and becomes even sweeter and better and stronger as that love is perfected over time and through trials together. And so it is with the love of God. And by keeping his word, then the verse 5, hereby know we that we are in him. Verse 6, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Can I say every Christian in this room ought to be ought to praise God for the word ought? Ought? I means you should, but God does not say every Christian always abides. Because there have been times in my Christian life I thought, oh, I must not be saved. Because, man, I've not been walking like I should. Oh, man, I must have lost my salvation. Well, there's no such thing as losing your salvation, number one. But it's a matter of you ought to do this. And who here could not say, honestly, yeah, that's what I ought to be doing. I ought to be keeping his word. I ought to be keeping his commandments. Now we say, it says at the end of verse 6, even as he walked, Jesus Christ is the ultimate model of how you are to live your life and conduct your affairs. That's why we study him all the time. We don't, you don't and we're an unusual church today. Every church used to have a Sunday, Sunday school hour and Sunday morning service and Sunday evening service and midweek service. That was biblical Christianity. Now in this haphazard, loosey-goosey age of if you feel it's good, do it, as if that's a verse of the Bible, now it's like, well, I'll, I'll try to come to the one Sunday morning service we have. Unless, of course, I'm going to go to a brunch on Sunday morning and sleep in. Then I'm going to go to the Saturday night praise and worship service. Because after all, it's, it's all about me and, and, and my wants and desires. That's, that's, God wouldn't want me to suffer by having to go to church more than once a week. And so that, that's, that's the modern attitude. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll say to you that, that you know, we, we're here so much because there's so much to learn. And we want to get all we can get. But even that's not enough. You're going to need him tomorrow and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Time with him. Your time. Not me. You know, filtering all this stuff and, then, and, 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 and being like a mama bird. I, I eat the worms and then I spit them up into you. And I stick them in your mouth. Why don't you go get your own worms? Be an early bird. Tomorrow morning, get your own worms. Don't just live off my regurgitation. All God's people said, yuck. <laughs> but that's just that's how it is sometimes. And, and I, I'm just saying that, hey, listen. He want, you, we study him. And by the way, my Old Testament tells me a lot about Jesus. I personally believe that uh, the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. I personally believe the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ. I personally believe Melchizedek is Jesus Christ. I personally believe that the man that showed up and talked to Moses, uh, I'm sorry, that talked to Abraham on the plains of Mamre was Jesus Christ. 
I think Jesus Christ is all through this book. So I, I study the whole book, not just a part of it. Even the parts I have to struggle through are still a blessing. Last scripture, please, I think. Yeah, it is. Okay, 1 John chapter 5. Two verses out of 1 John 5 as we come in for a landing. Obedience also reassures you of the validity of your salvation. 1 John 5 verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And then verse number three, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Beloved, what the Lord expects of us is not difficult to achieve, and it's not hard to perform. The only thing that's hard about it is just maintaining it. It's like having a car. Driving is easy. You know, owning a car, that's, you know, if you've got the finances, that's not a big deal. It's just having a car. It's the maintaining of it that's a challenge. And keeping it going. It, having a marriage, man, that's as easy as, you know, going to the justice of the peace with a person we would prefer in our church of the opposite gender. And you, and you get, you know, you, you, you fill out the paperwork and they, 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 they go through their mini ceremony and, man, you're married. You can do it in 15 minutes, I guess, in Las Vegas or Reno. And uh, in 10 minutes, you can be d divorced, you know. But, but you, 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 can, you can get it all accomplished pretty, pretty quick and easy. Uh, but to really have a quality marriage, man, it, it, it takes everything you've got and then some. You've got to invest yourself in it. And so it is with the things. The things we, it's, not, it's not that it's, it's hard. It's just the doing of it and then keep doing it and then keep doing it and keep doing it when the novelty wears off. Keep doing it when it gets old. Keep doing it when it's, it's not, doesn't fit your schedule. Keep doing it through changes of life. Keep doing it when you're giddy with excitement because some special thing came in your life. You know, uh, by God's grace and, and a gift of my son and daughter-in-law, Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Mrs. Miracle and I are going to do our first cruise. And we're not just going to cruise up and down Hillsburg Avenue either, brother. We're going to we're going to really cruise, and uh, we're going to head down to uh, to Long Beach and get on the, the ship and, and head out to Catalina, and then we're going to head on down to Baja, and then we're going to come back again. And wow, we, we can hardly believe we're. we're I, I, I still pinch my wife just to make sure she's, she's, she knows it's real. And I, I pinch her anyway, so why not? Just get another excuse. And so uh, we, we're just, just pinching ourselves. Is this for real? Is this really happening? I guess it is. It's coming up fast. It's coming up this next week. And, you know, why did I say that? I don't know. Because oh, I'm giddy with excitement. That's what it is. All of a sudden, it's becoming very, very exciting. But, you know, one of the things I envision... It, it's not sitting at the captain's table for dinner. That doesn't move me at all. All right, I have no, it's not ballroom dancing. We ain't gonna, all right, just not interested. Uh, we're not, we're not going to go, uh, if we just get out of the territorial waters, we can gamble. No, we're not, in the, we're not going to gamble. That's, 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 we don't think it's pleasing to the Lord. That's not an interest to us. It's not finding bargains on Baja. It's, it's, you know what it is? Besides spending time with each other and just having nothing to think about except keeping my breakfast down there's nothing else to worry about it's the idea of setting up on some table somewhere maybe in our room maybe on the deck maybe in some 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 inner room spreading out my bible my prayer journals and i spend time with the lord my sweetest time of the day is early in the morning when i'm I, 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 I turn and sit up next to my bed, and I'm kind of, you know, still kind of out of it, and I reach over, and I start grabbing my cell phone, and I do my daily devotional thing with, with some people, and then I grab my, my, my iPad, I do, I have some Bible I do on there, and, 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 a, and a daily priority prayer list, and then I reach over, and I have a, I have a, a real Bible I pick up, and, I'm, and I got my marker, I'm reading through that, and, and then I, uh, unless time is really a crunch then I go over to my desk and I have my devotional stuff there and then hope upon hope that I can squeeze into to a given weekday heading off to a coffee place and just sitting in a, in a chair and I pull out my have my bag 
And I pull out that Bible and those two notebooks of prayer requests, my two prayer journals, and I get to have maybe another 45 minutes with the Lord. And then when that's all done, it's like, okay, <laughs> got to Time to get <laughs> time to get to work. You have. Oh yeah. <laughs> Amen. I, I watched for you, and uh, saw you coming. Put real quick through that novel aside. Grab my Bible, brought it out, and put. Oh, what a good boy am I! And uh, but I'm just I'm just looking forward, without distraction. Having that special time with the Lord, how sweet it is. It's not difficult. It's just a matter of doing it. And you actually benefit from it. And it's the source of your joy. There's no doubt you can keep his commandments. The only question is if you will. As we've our heads please and close our eyes. This morning, if 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 Everything I've said is a reassurance to you, and it's like, yeah, I'm so glad I'm on track. And I, I know all of us have things to work on. I have areas I can improve, and I'm glad that I, I have a love life with Jesus. And this, this morning has just been an encouragement and a reinforcement and a blessing. Praise God for that. I'm so glad. But for the person who right now, man, your, your conscience is bothered and you're, you're, you're struggling right now. You may even be angry at me for daring to preach such things that are such an affront to your spirit. But I would just say, how about using that as an indication that the Holy Spirit is pleased with this. He has been yearning to get you in touch with your Savior and draw you closer to him. He wants that so much because Jesus wants that so much. And the Holy Spirit is here to do the will of Christ and to point us to him. Beware of any movement that wants to highlight the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job is to point us to Christ. And he wants so much to get you closer to your Lord. And the only, the only drawback is, is your reticence, your, your hesitation, your, your not willing to, to, to start and then continue. And continue when it feels good and continue when it doesn't, and continue when it's convenient, and continue when it's inconvenient. But just keep going, day in and day out, a daily walk with Christ, and then finding out what he would have you do over and above that. And slowly but surely, evermore, conforming yourself to the will of God. And one day, it's so exciting when you emerge into that point where the Lord says, okay, you've been honoring my general will for all Christians, now I have a specific will uniquely suited for you. This is why I created you. This is what you live for. And I'm so glad I can now direct you to that which is my specific will for you. Oh, what an exciting day that is when finally I bow the knee and say, Lord, wherever, whatever, I'm yours. Those, those of you who know your Old Testament, think of it like this. Take the all and bore the hole in my ear. I want to wander away no longer. I am your servant. You gave me the liberty to wander off. I am choosing to stick with you. Bore the hole through my earlobe. I want to be marked as a peculiar treasure of my Lord. I am yours and you are mine. Lord Jesus, speak to our hearts now, and if there's one here this morning that doesn't yet have Christ as Savior and have the assurance of salvation, may that person have the courage to step out from their seat, come straight to me and say, Pastor, Pastor, I need to be saved. And Lord, for others that are here that have trusted Christ as Savior, but they're struggling in an area, would you please move upon them to come and utilize this opportunity to pray here and and get something right with you. May some lead the way for others to follow. And Father, I pray there's any other matters they need each addressed. Give people the, the courage to speak up and get the help they need. Thank you, Lord. Beloved, as we all stand together, the music plays in the background, a song of invitation. 
you need Jesus as your Savior, if there's any doubt whatsoever about your salvation, I encourage you to step out right now, come down the aisle and shake my hand and say, Pastor, I need you to be saved. I've got some doubts about my salvation. If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, but somehow the message today has spoken to your heart, or perhaps you have something totally removed from this message, but it's heavy upon you, a concern about a loved one or a need that you have that's very pressing. Likewise, take advantage of the opportunity to come and pray. Meanwhile, if you would, you're welcome to join Brother Scott in singing the invitation song. First priority is your time with the Lord. Over and above that, you're welcome to sing with Brother Scott. He'll give us the number and lead us in this song. You're hearing hymn number 391. 391, I'd rather have Jesus. Please join me on the first verse, 391. 